Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I feel like it's old home week. Um, although I live now in Arizona, I grew up in a little town, or it was when I was growing up it was little, south of Houston called Alvin. Has anybody ever heard of Alvin? Oh, quite a few. It's, it's actually famous for two things. Um, it being the hometown of Nolan Ryan. Have you heard of Nolan Ryan? Yeah, everybody's heard of him. And also having mosquitoes about as big as your fist. So it was kind of a, uh, it was a good, good place to, to grow up. Um, I ended up, after I graduated from college, I ended up going to work for um, the highway department, or for TxDOT, um, in what was then called District 14. Now, somewhere along the lines, they lost the numbers but gained actual names. Do you remember what district District 14 was? Austin. Yeah, it was the Austin district. And I noticed that was where Lisa ended up her career with TxDOT. Uh, in fact, actually, when I, when I was working there, it wasn't even really called TxDOT. Does anybody remember what they called back in the late 70s, what they called TxDOT? It didn't exactly roll off your tongue. It was the State Department of Highways and Public Transportation. If, if you weren't real careful, people thought you worked for the State Department. They thought you were like a federal, some kind of fed or something. Anyway, I think TxDOT sounds um, a little bit better. Um, you're probably wondering, Holly Frontier, I've never heard of them. Who is that? Well, we're a small oil company. Although we're headquartered in Dallas, the refineries that we have are primarily located in the mid-continent and the Rocky Mountain region. Um, if we had branded gasoline stations or convenience stores, you would probably know a little bit more about us or at least have heard of us. But to do the convenience store thing means that we would have to have probably a little bit more knowledge than we have now about things like, like Cheetos, hot dogs, and Copenhagen, okay? We don't have that type of knowledge in our company as it currently exists. But what we do have is six asphalt terminals. It's actually uh, five asphalt terminals and one refinery rack, and I've got them listed up there. And I like to say that we are probably TxDOT's favorite asphalt supplier. And why would I say that? Because we don't sell a lot of asphalt here, so we can't, we can't screw things up too bad, can we, Jerry? We, we try sometimes. But anyway, um, so I'm coming at you today with, from the perspective of an asphalt supplier. What Dave asked me to talk about, even though the title is Asphalt Supply, um, he wanted me to talk about how asphalt binders have changed over the years, and you know we, we respond to specifications. So I'm going to spend some time talking about specs, refinery changes, polymers, super paved, and sort of my view of where we need to go or, or what I see happening in the future. Um, I think it was Harold Mullen that mentioned the, the Trinidad Lake asphalt, if you were paying attention, because that's the first actual asphalt that was used in the United States to pave a road. And as he mentioned, it was in Newark, New Jersey. So the early specifications for paving grade asphalts were built around Trinidad Lake Asphalt, or TLA. And there were two specs, color and solubility in a very, very nasty solvent, carbon disulfide. Um, Darren, I hope you weren't doing any kind of work with, with that stuff. Uh, why would they care about color? If, so you're building a road in Newark, New Jersey. Why would you care about color? Well, dark colors, as the uh, picture on the left shows, actually melt snow and ice better. So color was a, a very important thing to them. Why would they care about this stuff being totally soluble uh, in carbon disulfide? Well, the picture on the lower right gives you a hint there. They wanted to be sure that if they were buying a ton of, of, uh, of Trinidad Lake asphalt, that they were getting a ton of sticky stuff and not 1,900 pounds of, of sticky stuff and 100 pounds of sticks, twigs, and dead squirrels, and, and so forth. But those were the earliest asphalt specifications. Um, it was sort of, there, there was really, uh, even though the first roads were paved with Trinidad Lake asphalt, um, it was probably too expensive to actually continue that, uh, that line of work with that asphalt source. And I think it was somewhat serendipitous with the rise of um, the, the, the refining of transportation motor fuels from crude oil, that asphalt came along for the ride with that activity. Um, there was one primary process that happened at refineries back then that actually produced paving grade asphalt, and that's what's called fractional distillation or actually atmospheric distillation. And basically what they're doing is boiling the crude oil. And by the use of, of cooling reflux uh, trays, they were able to capture the different boiling point fractions 
that come out of the distillation uh, of, of crude oil. At the very top, the very lowest boiling point materials, you have things like butane and propane, or what we would call LPGs. Uh, going down through the list, you see gasoline, you see number one and number two fuel oil, otherwise known as kerosene and, and diesel fuel. And at the very bottom, it shows residue, and that's what, what we would call asphalt. Okay? So that was pretty much all they were doing back then. It was a separation process, very simple, uh, and it had a, um, a specification that went along with it that was also very simple. Everybody's mentioned the penetration. It seems like every speaker practically has mentioned the penetration test. And it's like Darren said, we never get rid of anything. We, we just sort of keep it along for the ride. Basically, this was a test for the, for the it was sort of an indirect indicator of the, um, uh, of the viscosity of the asphalt or the consistency of the asphalt. And the American Association of State Highway Officials back then they formalized this uh, penetration grading system in a thing that was called Ashto M20. And we got different grades. In Texas, I, I obviously wasn't around when they were doing this, but I would suspect that there were two primary grades back then, probably 85, 100, and 60, 70 pen asphalt. The higher the number, the softer the asphalt. There's a problem, though. When we run the penetration test, we're running it at only intermediate temperatures at room temperature, basically, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And so all we're seeing in terms of the physical properties of that asphalt are its, uh, its characteristics at that one temperature. And the problem is, if you look at what's going on with the asphalt at a multitude of temperatures, you can see that three asphalts, as in the example that I'm showing here, that have the same penetration grade can have very, very different properties at other different temperatures, such as high construction temperatures over on the right, at high pavement temperatures, which is kind of in the middle, right above 60 degrees C, and at low temperatures on the left-hand side of the graph. So there were some limitations to the penetration specification, both in Texas and elsewhere. Um, it didn't take long for people in the, uh, in the refining business to figure out that what they needed to do is mobilize quite a bit of chemical, chemical engineering muscle to produce from crude oil what was desired by the marketplace. And basically, in the last, I would say, 100 years, there have been a variety of processes uh, that have been developed at, at refineries in order to do this. And I'm showing a couple of things here. The diagram on the left is a bar chart of, of what you would get if you took some West Texas Intermediate crude and just distilled it under atmospheric conditions. Okay, and you would look at the very bottom of that. You get about 37% residue or an asphalt-like material. Um, you only get 25% gasoline, uh, number one and number two fuel oil, about 20%. Unfortunately, that is not what is needed in the marketplace. So a modern uh, petroleum refinery is built on taking what you would otherwise get on the left-hand side and producing what the market demands on the right-hand side. And you can see the changes, of course, there's quite a bit less residue or asphalt that's needed. We need uh, more number one and number two fuel oil, certainly more gasoline, um, and then there's all of the LPGs. Interestingly, there's a volume growth. Whenever you start to break apart the molecules of crude oil, you end up with more than what you started with. When you were a kid, did you ever dig a hole and you figured out that when you filled the hole back in, you had more dirt than what you started with? Same thing with crude oil. The other, the other thing to note is that not all crude oils are created equal in terms of asphalt supply. The crude oil that's on the left, I, I stole this picture off the internet somewhere. I'm pretty good about, about uh, do, uh, Jerry, I think that's a characteristic that you and I both have, stealing stuff off the internet. That one is probably a Venezuelan crude or maybe a Western Canadian crude, one that's very, very rich in asphalt. It probably yields 50% uh, asphalt or maybe maybe even more. The one on the right, I don't know what kind of crude oil that is, maybe it's a Saudi light, but it, it, it yields almost no asphalt, okay? And then there's various, you know, shades, you might say, in between. I'll sort of make a statement right now that, that, that says in North America, there are more crude oils available that are like the ones on the left than on the right, okay? So, so there is a preponderance of crudes that actually produce asphalt. Uh, I stole this slide. Um, one time I was making a presentation and I, I was trying to make a point that I felt like a dog ch chasing its tail. 
Do you know what kind of things that you end up with if you Google search dog chasing tail? It's not good. Okay, don't, don't, do, don't do that. Anyway, I stole this one from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Anything that's above an API gravity, which is on the x-axis, is sort of like what we would all know in this room to be specific gravity. Um, anything greater than 30 is a very, uh, what would be considered a, a, a light crude. It wouldn't yield a whole lot of asphalt, or it would yield less asphalt, let's say. Anything on the left-hand side would be a heavier crude. And then sour versus sweet refers to the sulfur content. Why are refiners interested in sulfur content of crude? Very important. Yeah, yeah, this ultra-low sulfur diesel. In other words, we now have um, federal regulations on the amount of, of sulfur emissions coming out of, of transportation motor fuels. So there's always this balance that, that refineries are trying to strike between cheap sour crudes that have a lot of asphalt and light sweet crudes that, that yield a lot of transportation motor fuels and no sulfur. Asphalt, of course, is on the upper left-hand side of that, that diagram. In case you're wondering, um, is there a, nope, I thought there was a pointer on this thing. Anyway, if you, if you look above, uh, where is it? Uh, look where it says 45 on the x-axis and go right above that. That shows WTI, that's West Texas Intermediate from the Permian Basin uh, part of Texas. That's the benchmark crude in the United States. Yields about 7% really crappy asphalt, actually. Ask me how I know. This is a process flow diagram. It's a very busy diagram of a very busy refinery. This is a, what I've called a complex and integrated refinery. It's complex from the standpoint that it can take all different kinds of crude and produce what it is that this uh, refiner uh, feels like they need to be selling. It's integrated in that it is a continuous process and not a batch process like the old days. In other words, you don't have to, to finish one step before you're starting another step. Okay, so you'll hear people refer to integrated refineries or complex refineries, and that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. Really, the only part of this refinery that is of any significance to us in this room is the lower left-hand side, and that shows the, well, there's the atmospheric distillation on the left. I talked about that as being sort of the old way of doing things. That is still a viable process in practically every refinery. And then there's the one that's called vacuum distillation, okay, and that is the primary process which creates asphalt. Um, keep going. There are actually uh, three overall processes in refineries. There's what's called separation, and those are the distillation uh, towers that I just showed. There's, there's convert various conversion processes. Those are things like cokers, fluid cat crackers, and things like that. Those are the things that tear apart the molecules of the crude oil to produce whatever it is that the refiners are trying to make. And then there's, tr there's uh, treatment processes, things to take the sulfur out of, the, out of fuels and, and so forth. Really, probably 98% of the asphalt, uh, or at least the paving asphalt, that is sold in the U.S. comes from a combination of atmospheric and vacuum distillation. But there are some other processes that are out there. They're not particularly new. They've been along, around a lot longer than I have, for sure. There's what are called SDA units, solvent deasphalting units. That's where you take the vacuum distillation bottoms, the asphalt, and you dissolve them in some type of a, of a solvent like propane or butane. And what that does is it separates the asphalt further into uh, what I've called feed and pitch. And what I mean by feed, that goes into one of those other processes, most likely a, cat, a fluid cat cracker, to make what? Gasoline. Okay, that's what they really like to do. The cat crackers are sort of the gold standard at a refinery. But what does that also leave behind? There's some other stuff up there. It's asphalt, but it's very, very hard asphalt. Very, um, it's, we call it pitch. People call it zero pin. Once again, Darren, a reference to the penetration test, hard base, a lot of different names for the same thing. It's very hard asphalt. Does that stuff make it into the paving asphalt pool? It does. It sure does. But you're going to have to soften it somehow. So the question is, how do you soften it? What's it cost? Uh, and you know, that kind of thing. So keep that, keep that mental picture in your mind. We'll, ra we'll wrap things up with that. Well, concomitant to the um, development of this chemical engineering muscle at these, at these refineries was a specification to go along. Starting in the, the 1960s, there were people who were advocating the use of a viscosity spec. 
Remember what I said about the penetration spec, that it just didn't do as really a thorough job as what we needed to do for modern roadways. So people came up with the, the, um, the viscosity or a specification that was built around the absolute viscosity. The main, and Darren I think showed a, a good picture of this. Uh, you load about 30 grams or so of asphalt in a tube. You measure the amount of time it takes to flow between a couple of calibration marks and that gives you what the viscosity of the asphalt is. And you do that at a number of different temperatures. So immediately you're better off with this because you're, you're more thoroughly characterizing asphalt at a wider range of temperatures. TxDOT was one of the first agencies that bought into this and I was talking to Darren earlier about when did that exactly happen and as near as we could both tell it happened sometime around 1970-ish okay because the first uh, spec book that came out which happened to be the, that had that in it which happened to be the same spec book that when I started at TxDOT was it was called the Brown Book and I believe that was 1972 so you figured they had to work up to that so that's why I say somewhere like late 60s, early 70s. Um, this viscosity specifications, it's kind of sort of like any, it's even like with the pen test or the pen penetration specification. There are advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, viscosity is a more fundamental test. The, the numbers actually mean something compared to how far a sewing machine needle pokes into a, 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 a small sample of asphalt. As I said, we're characterizing asphalt over a wider range of temperatures, and thus we can control the temperature susceptibility of the asphalt, which is a very important thing to do. But there were some disadvantages, or at least one. Um, it was perceived that the viscosity test didn't um, work too well with modified asphalts. Now, I, I'm not sure that's totally true, because there's a lot of viscometers that you can use, those straight wall tubes, which actually work very well with modified asphalts. And in fact, even before uh, for, for, for many years, we had been using viscosity-type technology in mod with modified asphalts. But I think more importantly, viscosity specs, th there, it was sort of bad timing, and there was a feeling that something was missing. The picture on the left I took in 1991, this is on Interstate 10, just uh, this side of Beaumont. And the, this was a, a, a catastrophic failure. It had nothing to do with the asphalt, okay? It was some bad engineering material selection decisions that caused the problem. But there were some jobs across the country that sort of looked like this. And, and CEOs of DOTs throughout the United States were saying, wait a minute, I think we can do better than this. You know, we can't, we can't build a job and hope that it lasts until we break the barricades, right? That's not the way we, we do business. So TRB, the Transportation Research Board, commissioned a, a study. It was called the Strategic Transportation Research Study, or STARS. And there was a report that came out in 1984, and I put a quote up here. And it says the procurement process for asphalt began more than 70 years ago. This was prior to the early 80s. This process does not accommodate approved adhesion, wetting, oxidation characteristics, and so on. The current knowledge of such desirable properties is not sufficient to be able to incorporate them in a procurement spec. What that meant was that in the early 80s, we had purchase specifications that were built on technology from like 50, 60, 70 years prior. So there was a feeling that we could do better. Um, there was a report that came out, an NCHRP report 269, that was done actually right here at Texas A&M by three superstar uh, pavements and material researchers, John Epps, um, Joe Button, and Professor Bob Galloway. And it said the physical properties of asphalt cements are more variable than 20 years ago, even though they remain within specification values, but variations in other factors may mask the influence of this variation on pavement performance. So there was a feeling in general that there was something that we needed to be testing that we weren't testing and putting it into a specification. And so that's what led to the Strategic Highway Research Program, otherwise known as SHARP. It was a five-year program. They spent 50 million bucks uh, on, um, on asphalt materials. Uh, it was done primarily at universities. And as Harold Mullen mentioned before, uh, Texas A&M and the University of Texas were, were two of the more prominent uh, research institutions that participated in this. The, the finished product was called SuperPave, as you all know. They came out with a new set of, uh, with a new specification for asphalt binders and tests to match. And it is adopted now throughout, I say, almost uh, all of US. The binder spec is standardized in AASHTO M320 or in TxDOT's uh, item 300, as most of you know. 
The mixed design and analysis system, I put no because as it was developed, very little of that made its way into general pack practice. There's the gyratory compactor and what else? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, to this day in Arizona, the state that I live in, I bet you that 60% of the mixes that gets placed, particularly on the local market, are done with, with, uh, under the auspice of the Marshall mixed design system. So the binder spec came and test came forward. The rest of it was a little bit uh, diminished. Uh, you all pretty much know what the numbers mean. PG6422, which is the workhorse binder in Texas, is an indicator of the temperature range over which you expect that binder to do its fair share to overcome rutting, uh, fatigue cracking, and low temperature cracking. Or another way to look at it is we're actually characterizing the asphalt at actual in-place service temperatures. Several of the other speakers have talked about the different uh, physical property tests that have come along with this. I, I forgot to say when, when, when the, the SHARP program got started, there was a feeling that what we really wanted was a chemical specification, okay? We wanted to know that the asphalt should have a pH of whatever, and that's probably not a good example, but you know what I mean. They wanted a, a, a chemical specification. But the people that did the bulk of the research were mostly civil engineers, people like us, and who felt more comfortable with physical property tests. And so that's why we ended up with things like this. You, you bang on a sample and you measure the response of that sample to that applied load. Okay, it doesn't hardly get any more simple than that. It's ironic, I think, that um, after a few years of the PG specification, um, it was sort of felt like that it didn't, it had the same deficiency that the viscosity grading system was purported to have in that it didn't work well for modified asphalts. So a lot of state agencies, including TxDOT, added on tests that were indicate that would were intended to be a screening test to make sure that the that the modification that they wanted was in there. And in Texas, that has been historically the elastic recovery test. But there's a, a whole host of others uh, that are out there that if you uh, if you care to run them. Um, a word about asphalt modifiers. Um, there are a whole litany of different things that you can put in asphalt to give it some desirable quality that it, ha that it doesn't have coming right out of the refinery. There's inorganic acids, primarily polyphosphoric acid that's used these days. There's polymers and stuff that comes along for the ride, like cross-linking agents. There's what I've called construction enhancers, and that's, of course, the warm mix additives. There's waste products, like scrap tires and shingles. The guy who runs the Rubber Pavement Association, he happens to be in Arizona, and I know him, and he, and he he would always come running up and say, stop calling it a waste product. Okay, it's a post-consumer product. Is that better? Okay. Fillers and fibers, anti-stripping agents, uh, hydrocarbons, oxidants, antioxidants. Extenders have gotten a lot of play in the technical literature lately. Have you ever heard of REOB, reclaimed engine oil bottoms? TxDOT now limits that to 5%. That's right. Um, and then there was what Dr. Epps Martin talked about about two presentations back, rejuvenators. So there's all kinds of things that we can put in asphalt. However, I think that within TxDOT, most of, the, most of the engineers believe that polymers are sort of the gold standard of asphalt modifiers. And the whole point of polymers is to actually improve the high temperature properties of the asphalt while not having too bad of an effect on low temperature properties. Or, to say it differently, it allows you to use a soft asphalt to get good low temperature performance and you recapture the high temperature performance with the addition of a polymer. There's all kinds of different polymers that are out there. I've sort of summarized them in two basic types, elastic types and plastic types. In my view, the, uh, or at least where I work, the plastic types don't have a lot of significance anymore. They used to, uh, but, but, but they've kind of gone away. Uh, most of the polymers that we're using these days are of the elastic variety, and they have various architectures that are combinations of, uh, of, of uh, styrene and butadiene uh, block copolymers. There's also waste post-consumer rubber that uh, people are now advocating as sort of a poor man's polymer, and those, that technology is still kind of developing. Um, a lot of advantages and even a few disadvantages to the use of polymers. There's obviously a significant performance history in the use of polymer modified asphalt. They have that elastic effect that those of us who are civil engineers like to see. We like to apply a load. When we release the load, we like that material to spring back. Otherwise, you get, if it doesn't spring back, you get a rut. Um, 
because we're here at a university, I, I thought, I, Dave, I better throw in some more Coulomb theory. You like that? Okay. Um, the shearing strength of a material is, equal, is a function of its angle of internal friction plus cohesion. What a polymer does is it actually improves the cohesion of the binder. Um, many specs are designed around stretchy polymers, so there's no mysteries from a supply standpoint or from a usage standpoint. And polymers, I, what, one of the things I like about them is that they, they actually form favorable uh, co-modifiers with other types of, of, of systems like, like, uh, like some of the acid-based systems. But they can be a challenge to manufacture, particularly if there's a compatibility issue between the asphalt that you need to use and the polymer that you're trying to, uh, trying to use. They can be tough to handle. Some of the high grades, like PG82s, have the consistency of chewing gum. Uh, they're very difficult uh, in terms of construction. Sometimes not heat stable if you keep them in a tank for too long at an elevated temperature. If you make emulsion, those of us who make emulsions know that, that sometimes they're a challenge to emulsify. Um, twice in my career, we have had supply disruptions, which means price spiking of polymers. Uh, and they're relatively expensive compared to some other uh, types of modifi modifiers. Um, asphalt usage. This is one that I really could go on a rant about. But if you look, I, I got this data from the Asphalt Institute, and th it turns out that they've been collecting um, asphalt usage data since the middle 1960s. And that number was about 25 million total tons of, of uh, paving asphalt used in the U.S. And that number sort of increased to a level of about 35 million tons up to about 2008, where the economy uh, hit the skids and you see the big drop off. Well, even though the economy has recovered, asphalt usage hasn't recovered. And what it, and I know what you're thinking, well, that guy's an asphalt peddler. Of course he wants to have more asphalt to be able to sell, and, and I do. Okay, so that, that part is, is true. But if you look at where the numbers are, extrapolate the left-hand side of that curve back down to, to 1960 or even back further my direction. What does that mean? We're using an asphalt at a level that matches up with the 1950s. Why is that? Money, right? If there's not money to, to buy asphalt, okay, we, we're not going to use it. And the reason I could go on a rant about this is that it's like we've got this world-class transportation system, but we're not spending enough money. Um, and and this, this could actually be all construction materials, not just asphalt. But we're not spending enough money to, to keep it in good condition. Lastly, I've got two more slides and I'll finish. Actually, three, and then I'll finish. Uh, main takeaways uh, for the future, I think that uh, from an asphalt manufacturing standpoint, again, there will always be asphalt supply. There's a, even though there, is, there are refinery units which rip apart the, the, the asphalt and turn it into other products, the preponderance of heavy asphalt-based crudes means that we should always have a stable supply. But there's going to be more blending of grades. You remember the two little beakers that I showed? One beaker is going to other refinery processes, leaving behind a beaker of hard asphalt. Okay, we have to figure out how to use that stuff. Uh, there is a new PG specification on the horizon. It's actually been adopted in, I don't know, probably a dozen or so states. Uh, the closest state to here, I think, is Oklahoma has adopted it. Uh, it's the new PG spec. It uses compliance of asphalt. That's the inverse of stiffness, right? It uses that. Uh, instead of stiffness, and there's no more bumping of grades. You're not going to lie to the asphalt and tell it that it's in a hotter climate than it really is. You're going to increase the, or decrease the, the required compliance that you, that you need. Um, there will be more PG plus specifications, and Dr. Epps Martin mentioned Delta TC. Remember that? In her rejuvenator presentation. I think that's one of the things that could actually sneak in as a PG plus spec. When she left and walked down and said hi to me, I said, how do you feel about Delta TC? Is it, a, is it related to performance? She said, I think so. I think so. So there's somebody who's really, really smart, who's doing cutting edge research, who thinks that that's a good, uh, good parameter. Um, combat compatibility tests, by that I mean, if we're gonna be doing all of this blending of cats and dogs to make paving grade asphalt, we need to make sure that those cats and dogs are compatible with each other. So I, I, there used to be a test called the Oleensis spot test. I haven't seen it in many years. It kind of has gone away, but, and I don't want to see it come back, but I think tests like that, that measure compatibility, you're, you're, you're laughing at me. <laughs> anyway, tests like that, that indicate the compatibility of the asphalt with itself. And then I hope that sometime in my lifetime, 
that we can come up with better aging tests. You know, there's everybody and their brother has come up with a new physical property test for asphalt materials, and this is mix as well as binder. But we have no clue if we're testing the binder that's aged to a condition that simulates what it's like out on the road. I hope that we can come up with something. Um, I remain optimistic, but uh, we'll see. Lastly, modified binders. I think as sort of as bad as it is on asphalt aging tests, I think we've come a long way in our ability to test mixes and get real life performance data out of that. And so right now we can quantify, I think, the effect of modifiers on ultimate pavement performance. So we can tell, is it really worth it to spend the extra money? There's an example of that that's come out the past few years. Have you ever heard of HIMA? Highly, highly modified asphalt? It was a concept that was uh, developed by uh, uh, Craton, uh, one of the suppliers of, of polymers. And I think that there will probably be some boutique polymers that come up that will uh, help people like me who are supply, I'm not supply challenged, but my supply may change from year to year. Um, I need to make sure that I have a polymer that's compatible with that. And then lastly, asphalt usage. I have no clue. Of all the states that I work in, and I work in seven or eight states, uh, three or four fairly extensively, and I'm telling you, they're taking money away. Okay, they're not going to increase uh, material available for asphalt and other construction materials. It's going, it's going elsewhere. Uh, in Texas, that's a little different. I read up uh, on this. There's a thing called the UTP, the, what is that again? Unif Unified Transportation Program. And it's going to mean over 10 years, you said 70 billion? Man, we're talking some money there. I think that's great. I think it's forward thinking uh, on the part of, of the transportation professionals in Texas. The citizens of Texas who I guess are going to find the money to do it. Uh, I wish that some of the other states that I work in would follow. That's pretty much it. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here. I've gotten to see a lot of old friends who I haven't seen in a long time. Um, really thank you for that. If you ever get over to Arizona, give me a call. We'll take you hiking or biking or just out somewhere to have a good time. Thank you.